Good morning, church family. Today's Bible reading is taken from Daniel, chapters 11, verses 1 to 4, and verse 36. Daniel 11, verse 1. And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided towards the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Turning to verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is complete accomplished for what is decreed shall be done as we continue in our series through the second half of daniel's book we've now reached chapter 11 which i've entitled how to live in difficult times how do you live when times are difficult, when circumstances are against you? How are you to face those things, and how do you normally face them? In this passage, we begin with these words, and now I will show you the truth. So the angel, the angelic messenger, reveals to Daniel a very detailed prophecy over the course of chapters 11 and 12, in which he tells him the truth of what is to come. And he also tells him how the Jewish people are to respond to what is coming. Now imagine with me, you and I could get into a time machine and go back 100 years. And 100 years ago, we were going back in time and we want to explain to someone living back then, let's say a farmer here in Australia, we want to explain to them what a cell phone is and how it works. How would you do that? What words would you use? Because after all, they don't understand most of the words that we relate to something like a cell phone or modern technology. How would you describe to them that one day, a hundred years from now, you'll have this little rectangular box in your pocket and you can pull it out and call just about anyone in the world you want and you can even look at their face in real time. They wouldn't know what that phrase meant maybe, but in real time, you could look at their face and speak to them. You could also do your banking, all of your financials, you could write notes. You could do all these many things with this little rectangular box. And you could even get directions to a place you had never been before where invisible waves go from your little box to a much bigger box in outer space and back to you through something we call GPS to get you anywhere in the world. How would you describe all that? Well, of course, at least part of it would be this. You'd have to use words they already understood. And you would realize very soon in the conversation the best you're going to hope for is to give them an approximation of what you're saying. But they're never really going to understand until, of course, they experience something like that technology you're describing. Well, that's a bit like what's happening in Daniel's book, the second half, where he's being uh, able to receive these messages from the angelic messengers, these prophecies, and yet it's all about the future. And some of the elements or the details of the future, no doubt Daniel, even as he's receiving these, he doesn't understand all of this. He doesn't understand what every detail is referring to because it's going to happen one, two, three hundred years or even a thousand years into the future from his time period. And yet, that's not to say Daniel's not getting the main idea, which is that God, as we saw earlier, rules in history, through history, and over history. But you and I, we have the benefit of hindsight, and as we often say, hindsight is twenty twenty. We get to look back in history and see what all of these details referred to, and that's what we're going to do, at least in a limited way, this morning. Now, we can approach chapter 11, particularly in two ways. 
One is we could look at every single detail and correlate it to exactly what happened in history and give the full explanation. And there is certainly benefit to that. However, if we were to do that just for chapter 11, it's going to take us at least several Sunday mornings to do that. Uh, furthermore, I would assume that most of us are probably not as familiar with Near Eastern history uh, in the four or 500 years leading up to Jesus Christ. And so the names and the dates and the places and the kingdoms and all the intrigue that's being described here would be a little bit beyond us, and we'd have to take a little extra time to think about it. Just to give you an illustration of how detailed this passage is and how it correlates to history, John Calvin, writing 400 years ago with far less historical and archaeological knowledge than we have today, when he described this passage and wrote it out extensively and what all of it referred to, it took him more than 40 pages of modern typescript to describe it. Well, we don't have time to go into that sort of detail. So the other method we could use is to look at it a little bit more from a, a 40,000 foot view and get the big picture while then jumping in and giving a few examples of just how detailed this is and how those details correlate to history. And so that's the method we're going to use. I'll give you three or four examples where we'll dive into just a couple verses and show exactly what those mean. But then we'll pull back out again so that we get the major emphasis. And along the way, of course, we want to draw out some important implications at the end for how we are to respond today. Because remember, for the Jewish people and for Daniel, the question was, given all this vision, given all that's going to come, all the trials and difficulties, how are the Jewish people supposed to respond when those trials and difficulties come? And by extension for you and I, how are we to respond in difficult times today? The passage will help tell us. And what, what it will tell us is this. In difficult times, the way to respond for a child of God is this. To respond according to revealed truth and the precious promises of God. To respond in difficult times according to God's revealed truth and the precious promises of God. Now verses 2 to 36 are split into two parts. One is a bit of Near Eastern history and the transition from the Persian Empire under which Daniel currently was living when he received this vision, the Persian Empire to the Greek Empire over the course of about 200 years. And then the second half of the passage we're looking at considers that contemptible individual that we've seen several times, Antiochus Epiphanes. So let's begin with a bit of important Near Eastern history told in detail more than 100 years before the facts eventually come to pass. We see the transition from the Babylonian Empire that Daniel started under, you might remember, and some of the visions concern that empire, but now this vision is talking about the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, under which he currently is living at the end of his life, and it tells us that there are going to be four more Persian kings, the fourth of which is going to be more powerful and stronger and more rich or wealthy, and then eventually there's going to be this transition to the Greek Empire, which will take over what used to be the Persian Empire. Look at verses 2 to 4, which have, which in case I should say our first example, verses 2 to 4. And I will show you the truth, he says. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches... He will stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. And then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with a great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven. But not to his posterity, that is, not to someone in his direct biological line, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, that is, these four uh, kingdoms into into which his one kingdom is broken, will never have the full authority or power or prestige that he had. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. What's going on here? Well, it says three, kings, three more kings will arise in Persia. This is exactly what happened. Just by way of historic example, Cabeses, Pseudo-Smyrtes, which is a very interesting name, um, and Darius I are the next three kings in Persian history, followed by Xerxes I. Now, Xerxes in the Bible, you might re remember from the book of Esther, he's called a Hasuerus. In the ancient world, oftentimes kings and dignitaries would have several names. So Xerxes I is a Hasuerus of the book of Esther. And you might remember from a previous passage here in Daniel that this same Xerxes acted 
in military campaign against Greece several times in approximately the year 480 BC. And he won some great victories. But then we're told a mighty king, Alexander the Great from the Greek Empire, is going to appear in verse 3, but eventually his kingdom, after 13 years, will be broken off and split into four parts. And on the map, you can see, as we've seen in other visions, that there are four commanders who come into play from Alexander's empire because he doesn't have a biological heir, and the kingdom, the Greek Empire or kingdom, is split into four parts. Now, the two parts that primarily we are concerned with are the Seleucid Empire, that's the kingdom of the north, as it's about to be called in this passage, and the kingdom of the south, the Ptolemaic Empire. Ptolemy and the Ptolemaic Empire was approximately Egypt, what modern-day Egypt, and the Seleucid Empire, the kingdom of the north, was approximately Syria of today. Now, what happens in verses 5 to 20 is this. We have this description of the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south and how they're constantly warring against each other, and caught in the middle is the land of Israel, the Jewish people. And so they're constantly on the battleground or in the middle of the battleground. And these two kingdoms are fighting and usually uh, trampling through militarily their land. And sometimes attacking the Jewish people as well. And so this uh, verses 5 to 20 gives very clear detail of what's going to happen during that time period. This is going to take place over more than 150 years. And it's to warn the Jewish people ahead of time, but also to comfort them. Don't worry, God's in charge. He knows what's happening. When you see these details unfolding, and it'll be very obvious when they do, don't lose hope. Don't give up. God is with you. And that leads us to our second example. Look at verses 6 to 9. After some years, they, kingdom of the north and south, shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north and make an agreement... But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure. That's just another way of saying they will be killed. But she shall be given up, and her attendants, he who fathered her, and he who supported her in those times. And from a branch, from her roots, one shall arise in his place. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north. He shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images and precious vessels of silver and gold. Haven't we seen another king early on in the book of Daniel carrying off vessels of gold and silver from the land of Israel? And so here we come full circle again. Someone else is going to do that, not from the land of Israel in this particular passage, uh, but from the kingdom of the north and bringing it back to the kingdom of the south. And for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. And then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south but shall return to his own land. What is happening here? The daughter of the king of the south will make an alliance. The two kingdoms will make an alliance, and she will be a part of that alliance through marriage. But she's unable to retain her place and will be cut off. This woman's name in history was Bernice. She was the daughter of Ptolemy II, the granddaughter of Ptolemy I, the general who began the Ptolemaic Empire. And she was given in marriage to the king of the north, in a politically arranged marriage. And in order for it to work out, in hopes that the two kingdoms would stop fighting each other, in order for it to work out, the king of the north had to divorce his first wife in order to marry Bernice, his second wife, so that they could have this politically arranged marriage. The king of the north, his name was Antiochus. Now, in order to accomplish all this, as you might imagine, uh, it, it created, with the, the divorce of his first wife, a lot of hatred, a lot of friction, but as soon as Bernice's father died, the king of the south, which only happened two years after their marriage, as soon as her father passed away, what does the king of the north do? He divorces Bernice and goes back to his first wife. But his first wife is not happy with him for what has happened. So what does she do? She plots and poisons both the king, Bernice, and her entire entourage, and they're all dead. Now then, another thing transpires, because the king of the south, Ptolemy, the second had died. Who becomes the new king? Well, it's his son, the brother of Bernice, Ptolemy III. And he is none too happy that his sister has been treated in this way and then ultimately assassinated, and he's not going to take it lying down. So he raises an army, goes up to the kingdom of the north, defeats it, and carries away a great deal of spoil, including their idols, just as the details in this passage tell us. 
Now, verses 10 to 19 give many further details about the career of the next king of the north, Antiochus III. And then verse 20 introduces a person who connects the events of verses 2 to 19 and verses 21 to 36. And so this is the bridge between these two sections. This individual was Seleucus IV. Thankfully, at least for a while in these two kingdoms, everyone just had the same name with an extra number added at the end of their name in rapid succession. Seleucus IV, he attempted to collect taxes, very high taxes, from those in his domain, uh, including the Jewish people. It, it seems that politicians wanting to collect high taxes is not a new thing, by the way. And he wants to collect these high taxes. It doesn't go very well for him, as the uh, one verse that we have here, verse 20, indicates. And if you want to read about this, you can read about it in the book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 3, an ancient document that we have. But before continuing with the introduction of this next section and the, this prototype of the contemptible individual Antiochus IV Epiphanes, which we've already seen come up several times in Daniel's book, we should just pause and think about what was the purpose of this vision again. It's not just to give details for the sake of details. All that's being given is to reassure, reassure Daniel's future countrymen, because Daniel will be long dead by the time all this happens. It's to, it's to reassure Daniel's future countrymen, the Jewish people living in the land of Israel primarily, the people who are going to live through all this, they need to be assured that God knew exactly in advance what was happening and that he was in control. He, this wasn't past his purview or past his ability to deal with. God's people could rest assured that things were on track. Everything was happening, as we saw at the beginning of chapter 10, according to the divine decrees of God. Now, difficult times are, are never easy. We don't like those difficult times. We don't want difficult times in our lives. And when they show up, most of us want them out of our lives as quickly as possible. But one of the things that helps us get through difficult times is to know there's something better coming. To have hope that, that something better is going to arise. These difficult times won't last forever. And that's what this passage provides the Jewish people with. And we're introduced in verse 21 and then all the way up to verse 36 to Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And this leads us to our third example. Look at verses 21 to 23. In his place, that is, the place of the previous king, shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. That is, he's not going to be very kingly. And Antiochus IV Epiphanes was considered by many who uh, worked in his kingdom to be mentally unstable. There's little respect for this individual from anyone, but you had to go along with what he said because he was absolutely ruthless. And he would come by his kingdom, not through normal aristocracy, and even though he was in line to be the monarch, he actually wasn't the first in line, through deceit and manipulation and bribes. That's how his kingdom would go forward. He shall come without warning and will obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken even to the prince of the covenant. And from the time that an alliance will be made with him, he shall act deceitfully. And he shall become strong with a small people. His kingdom by this time, it wasn't a great kingdom. And the Roman Empire, which from his point of view was in the western part of the country, they were beginning to grow. The southern empire had equal weight to his northern empire. And his northern empire had fallen on hard times. But he was determined he was going to make this kingdom great as it once was. Or so he decided. And so he attempted. So what happened? Well, he had early military victories, which gave him a very big head, all the way to the point of early in his career, calling himself Antiochus, his name, but giving himself the added name of Epiphanes, that is God in human form. And the rulers of Egypt at this time, the southern kingdom, had become quite lax. And so when Antiochus takes his army and goes to the southern kingdom to attack them, essentially the rulers do nothing to stop him. They just let his army come through, attack the people, take everything they want, and go away, hoping that they won't come back again. And then we're told that even the prince of the covenant shall be swept away. This most likely refers to the fact that he had the godly high priest in Israel, 
Onias III assassinated. And then he also took bribes from various Jewish individuals to see who would be the next high priest, eventually settling on the man who gave him the most money for that position, even though that man was not qualified because he wasn't in the line of Aaron as was required. So he makes war, yes, on the kingdom of the south, but this whole time he's also constantly harassing the Jewish people as we saw in a previous prophecy, and he's going to do more in just a moment. Verses 24 to 28 speak of his interactions with the king of the south, how Antiochus plundered the temple in Jerusalem during one of his campaigns coming back. But then the fourth and final example we'll consider is verses 29 to 33. Look at this. Verses 29 to 33 says... At the time appointed, appointed by whom? Remember, this is hearkening back to chapter 10, by the decree of God. All this is happening according to God's determination and decree. So who has appointed this time and this contemptible individual to come and do these contemptible, horrid things? It's God. This is part of his plan. At the appointed time, he shall return, this individual, Antiochus, and come into the south, just as God predicted and declared. But it shall not be like the time before. It won't be as easy for him as it was the first time. For ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdrawal, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the holy covenant. That's the Jewish people. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the holy covenant, Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering. And they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. That same phrase is used again. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. How do you think that phrase struck the Jewish people when they were experiencing this? The people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. God knew there would be a remnant, as he always decrees there will be, that some would stand up and follow his way no matter what. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. This fourth example is quite interesting in the annals of history. Antiochus was on his way to invade Egypt again, wanting to no doubt get some more and easy spoil, just as he did the first time. But that's not what happened. These ships of Kittim, as the uh, passage before us states, this was a group of ships from the growing Roman Empire at the time, and it was under a general called Popelius. And this Popelius, with the, the Roman group, who was not in charge of Egypt at the time, but they were kind of knocking on the door of the northern kingdom, Antiochus's kingdom, as the Roman Empire spread out and was spreading east, west, north, and south. But one of their major trade partners was Egypt, because Egypt had fertile land. And Rome, as with every growing country, desperately needed consistent food supplies. And so this Popelius, with a, a group of soldiers that came with um, really a a trade delegation, if nothing else, to Egypt, he meets Antiochus on his way down. And this Papilius, he was a stern general. He wasn't going to give an inch to Antiochus. And he told him in no uncertain terms, go back to your land. You are not welcome here. You may not go another step. And Antiochus, stalling for time, says, oh, let me speak to my advisors about what I should do. But the Roman general was not fooled. He knew what Antiochus wanted to do was go back, raise a larger army than the one he brought with him. Because remember, Antiochus didn't think he was going to have any opposition, so he brought a small army. And so Antiochus says, I want to go talk to my advisors, which really meant I want to go back and raise a larger army. And then he was going to come back. But instead of granting him that time, Papilius, with the characteristic Roman determination, draws a circle in the sand around where Antiochus is standing and says, summon your counselors, deliberate now. If you move outside of this circle without guaranteeing me, you will not come back and will not attack. Then Rome will declare war on you and your entire kingdom. And the last thing Antiochus needed was a war with the growing Roman Empire because then he would have an enemy to his south and an enemy to his west both of whom could quickly overwhelm him if they joined forces. And so he has to humble himself. He is publicly humiliated. He can't attack. He doesn't have a large enough army. But now he must leave 
giving his word he will not be back. He's been humiliated. And remember, this was a man who thought he was God in human form. So what do you think he did, as most people who are humiliated do? On his way back, he takes out his anger on the Jewish people. And this is where he commits that abomination that makes desolate, the passage is talked about over and over again. He attacks the Jewish people, wiping out tens of thousands of them in the process, destroying the sacrifices at the temple, and does much else that we've already considered. So if these promises, or I should say prophecies, if these prophecies were made when the book of Daniel claims they were made, and they were, and each of them comes true in the smallest detail, and they do, then that leads us to at least three conclusions or applications. And here they are. <clears throat> First, who are these prophecies made in the name of? Prophecies are made in the name of someone or something, and in this case, it's made in the name of the God of the Bible. And that means, since all of them come true, among other things, that he is the only true God. Because no other God in any other religion has predicted the future like this. Not, not a single one even comes close. The only way in which these detailed events can come true in this fashion, even though they're given hundreds of years before the fact, is if, in fact, there is an all-powerful God behind them who has decreed that they will come about, and he has absolute power to bring them about. And that's exactly what we saw at the beginning of chapter 10. God, the one true God, decreed that they would happen. And so what all this means is, firstly, that the one, there's only one true God and that he alone should be followed. Secondly, the fulfillment of biblical prophecies shows that the Bible in which they are recorded is God's book. It has his stamp of authenticity about it. Now, there are many other evidences why the Bible is God's word. Far too many evidences for us to consider here. But fulfilled prophecy alone, even if we put all the other evidences aside, just the fulfilled, consistent prophecies in the Bible, especially detailed prophecies like the ones in this chapter, validate the Bible as not of a merely human origin. This is impossible. And by the way, statisticians, mathematicians have done the calculations. It's absolutely impossible for a prophecy like this or any of the prophecies of the Bible to be given in this detail and to come about hundreds of years later in a precise way with not a single mistake. It's statistically impossible. So what does that mean? It validates the Bible. It sets the Bible far apart from all other so-called holy books or religious texts. The Bible is unique because it is a unique revelation of God. And thirdly, the fulfillment of prophecy shows that the God who disclosed all of these events through his angelic messengers to Daniel, to other prophets, the God behind all these events is able and committed to keeping his promises. Everything he promised came to pass. When we find ourselves in, in difficult circumstances, as the Jewish people were about to find themselves in hundreds of years of difficult circumstances, our faith can often waver, and we tend to wonder, is God really with us? Does he care? Is he capable? Is he able to do something? Does he know what's going on? Those are the questions that naturally arise in the human mind and heart. Yes, he does. He knows. Not, just does, not only does he know all the circumstances we're facing, but he is capable of doing something about it. And everything that happens to a child of God, we're told in places like Romans 8, happened for a purpose. God knows what's happening, and he's accomplishing something through it. Now, in the midst of it, we rarely can see what he's accomplishing. How do we live in difficult times? We live according to the revealed truth of God and the precious promises of God. So study them, know them, and claim them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that as the songwriter says, the minutest circumstance in our life it has been decreed by you, is known by you, and you have promised to be with us no matter what. May we claim the promises of God that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you are with us no matter what, that you will walk by our side all the way through death and into your eternal embrace. 
May we know your promises and your truth, claim them and live by them. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.